Uh, it would not have taken us long to know of the news. The Hungarian newspapers reported about the breakout of the Korean War. Um, but we were one of the first countries to provide troops after the UN resolution. Australia deployed its third regiment. The two New Zealand frigates arrived in Korea. They arrived in Busan. All the Canadian participants in the, um, in the Korean War were volunteers. It was horrendous. 121 were killed in action. Decided to accept North Korean orphans. 340 Australian soldiers that lost their lives. The 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. They fought for peace and for freedom. We will remember them. Let us remember tragic experiences, their courage and sacrifice. So we should never stop fighting for a better world. And let's remember that war is never a good answer to any question. Uh, for me, uh, personally, it was something I learned about at a very young age because one of my teachers uh, participated in the Korean War. Personally, I sense that over more recent years, um, and certainly with the publication of one or two more histories of the Korean War, perhaps the consciousness of the Korean War and why it was important and of the impact that it made uh, on the lives of people who participated in it from the UK, I think that consciousness has grown a little bit. In June 1950, Britain had both uh, representation in Seoul and it had a considerable military presence in Hong Kong as well. And so uh, it would not have taken us long to know of the news that the forces of North Korea had invaded South Korea. On the 27th of June 1950, the government of the UK decided unanimously that they would support the United Nations action and that they would commit troops to the, the action. And one action in the war that I'd like to talk about and one which uh, made a lot of news uh, in uh, the UK at the time, and one which is still very much remembered in the UK, relates to Bill Speakman. And Bill Speakman won the very highest military order for valour through an action that he was involved in in November 1951. Bill Speakman was in a position where he and, uh, and his mates were very seriously outnumbered by the Chinese forces. Uh, but he took his own initiative to fill his pockets with grenades to charge uh, against the, the Chinese positions. And repeatedly, he and a number of his colleagues uh, charged the Chinese positions, uh, threw grenades at them. Um, and uh, as the citation which describes Bill Speakman's action tells us, uh, he did this with utter contempt for his own personal safety. 
So not caring anything about the danger that he was putting himself in, he put everything into trying to keep back this Chinese attack. And last year, members of his family came back with his ashes uh, to bury the ashes at the UN cemetery in Busan. And it was a great privilege for me to be involved in that ceremony, to stand alongside the family of Bill Speakman as uh, his wishes were fulfilled uh, and his ashes were brought back to the soil of Korea. The Korean War obviously wasn't just about people like Bill Speakman, who became famous in the UK for what he did during the war. It was also about thousands of ordinary service personnel, ordinary soldiers, seamen, airmen, and it was about people who were very young. And this is a, a letter from uh, Paul Burke, he was 18 uh, when he came to Korea, and he wrote this letter towards the end of the war, uh, just before Christmas 1952. And he writes, the best bit of news we've had so far is that in all probability we shall spend Christmas out of the line. So there he is looking forward uh, just before what would have been the last Christmas in the war, looking forward to be able to pull back a little bit from the front line and enjoy his Christmas with his mates. So there you have the testimony of just a very ordinary young man who probably grew up never expecting that he would have been sent out here uh, to fight in a country that, who knows, he may never have heard of before he even arrived here. But in many ways, he's also very typical of the thousands of British service personnel uh, who came to participate in the Korean War. When I see the uh, successive visits uh, of British veterans to Korea to commemorate their participation in the Korean War, I see two things. One, uh, I see uh, the great respect uh, which uh, the British population has um, for what they did and for what they endured when they were here 70-odd uh, years ago. And they are both amazed by what they see has become of the country that they're coming back to, but I think they are also absolutely overwhelmed by the generosity of the welcome they get they don't think of themselves as heroes, many of them, but the hero's welcome they get, I think, really touches their hearts, and it really is something that it is a great privilege and an honor to participate in. I salute the generations who experienced the dark years of the Korean War. I think of all the people who were personally caught up in the war, as combatants, as inhabitants of destroyed or occupied towns, villages and cities, or as refugees. As years go on, fewer and fewer people will be around to offer direct testimony of the war. So when we say, as we often do at commemorative ceremonies, we will remember them, let's mean what we say. Let's remember the terrible experiences they had to endure. And let's remember that war is never a good answer to any question. Australia has always been proud of its values, freedom, democracy, rule of law, and we've always been willing to support the international order to fight for those values. On 1st July, our first warships were deployed to the Korean Peninsula. 
The day after, on 2nd July 1950, Australia deployed 77 squadron of Australia's Royal Australian Air Force. And in September in 1950, Australia deployed the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment. In Australia, we have Korean War Memorials in major capital cities in Canberra, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Hobart to commemorate those that fell. Every year here in Korea, the Australian Embassy is proud to participate in a range of events that commemorates the Australian soldiers that fought during the Korean War. This is the book, The Name Still Charlie, by Owen Green. I referred to the deployment of 3rd Battalion of the Australian Army in September 1950. The battalion was actually led by Charlie Green. Only after 33 days of deployment on the Korean Peninsula, the commander of 3 RAR passed away and was killed in action. This book by the wife of Charles Green, Owen Green, records the path of Charles Green to Korea. It's not just about war, it's not about Charles Green's heroic war history, but it's about the sense of loss of a mother, of a daughter, of a family that has lost the husband. The telegram boy came around Bancroft's corner riding his bike. I remained fixed to the step. A thud hit my chest as I took the envelope. I opened it and read, Regret to inform you that your husband, 2-37504, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Hercules Green, was wounded in Korea. Stop. Suffering from shrapnel wound. Stop. Further information received will be conveyed to you immediately. Army HQ. Owen Green found out the following day of her husband's death. Owen Green spent much of her life following Charlie's death, researching about the Korean War and Australia's participation. She has left a lasting legacy in reviving the memories of Australian veterans that fought during the Korean War. End of last year, she passed away 69 years after Charlie's death. Owen's wish is now to be buried alongside Charlie at UN Memorial in Busan. My dearest Charlie, I've been dwelling on the short but rich time we had together. The good times were wonderful, weren't they? Lately, I've stopped having the bad dream that you are so far away and couldn't get in touch with me. I probably didn't tell you that you are the finest human being that I've ever known. Please be at peace and remember that I've always loved you. Your loving wife, Owen. There were many Australian soldiers that safely returned to Australia after the Korean War. But like Charlie Green, there were 340 Australian soldiers that lost their lives here on the Korean Peninsula fighting for peace and prosperity. Vincent Healy was a young soldier that died during the Korean War. But this story is not just about Vincent and his ultimate sacrifice fighting here. It's a story of his mother and the family. Thelma, Vincent's mother, upon hearing of Vincent's passing away, desperately wanted to come to Korea and tend to the grave of her son. But she did not have the funds to be able to afford to make the 15,000 kilometer trip to Busan. 10 years of hard work and saving led to her making the solo journey to Busan to finally meet and tend to her son's grave in Busan in 1961. It is truly a story of emotion, sense of loss, but the tragedy of war. A 
and the loss that a mother can sense on the news of the son's death. Let us remember the tragedy of war. Let us not forget the sacrifice of our fallen soldiers. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. This monument here is built uh, by the Korean government to show the, um, their thanks for the participation of the Netherlands in the Korean War, 1951-53. It's very special to be in this place. I mean, I read about the Korean War, I read about the, the Dutch soldiers participating, and especially in this area with a lot of hillsides that had to be uh, defended and the fierce battles that took place. In February 1951, the North Korean and Chinese forces launched a large-scale counterattack on Wang Song where the Korean and UN forces were deployed. Because of the surprise attack, many Korean and UN troops fell and they had to retreat. The only way for the Korean and UN forces to retreat was through the Wong Chong Wang Song Road, which was called the Massacre Valley. And the Dutch battalion, which was near Wang Song at that time, protected that road for 12 days and nights through very fierce battles allowing the Korean and UN forces to retreat. Um, but we were one of the first countries to, um, to provide the troops after the UN resolution was uh, uh, accepted in 1950. Uh, the Netherlands was one of the first countries who really sent uh, the army at that time. I think after winning, uh, after the war, the Second World War, we really wanted to help countries for, to help to regain their freedom. Well, first, um, we started with a ship that was already in the region. Um, and then later on, um, the UN requested again also to send a battalion. So we sent um, uh, troops there. So we had the volunteers coming here. And I think they left in, in September. So this is a book uh, written by a daughter of one of the veterans. It's Françoise Appels. Ik was rond de twintig. Ik studeerde in Amsterdam, maar was in de vakantie thuis bij mijn ouders. Het was een zonnige dag. Ik lag op mijn buik op het gras in de tuin met een oude luchtbux die ik in de schuur had gevonden. Mijn vader luierde in zijn stoel en op mijn vraag hoe je zo'n ding moest vasthouden, kreeg ik aanwijzingen van hem. En even later vroeg ik mijn vader, wat deden jullie daar nou precies in Korea? En het antwoord luidde, heuvels veroveren. Ik begreep daar niet veel van. Het leek me dom. Heuvels veroveren. And then later on, she realized that Korea indeed has a lot of hills. But she also realized, I mean, she found it very difficult exactly what had happened, and there was not that much material. So she wrote this book to understand what her father went through. So this was the postcard from Martin Schuriga addressed to his wife for Christmas. Prettig kerstfeest en gelukkig nieuwjaar. Ik ben weer verhuisd, zitten nu in stellingen aan de Han Rivier 
oost van Seoul in Midden-Korea. Volgt de berichten over de 2e divisie eh, Amerikaanse leger, het 28e regiment. Alles nog steeds oké. Okay. De koude is hier ontzettend erg en ontzettend met een uh, extra accent. Uh, dat is onze grootste vijand. Over twee maanden wordt het hier zomer. Ik hoop dat dan alles voorbij is. Erg is het hier met de vluchtelingen. Deze mensen zijn zwaar getroffen, tot twee à drie keer toe, in verband met de frontverschuivingen. Kusjes voor de kinderen, dag, liefs en zoenen van je liefhebbende Martin. It's very touching to, to read that and then also to realize that he did not make it. He, he died in this battle of Wen, Wing Song. The family received uh, his personal belongings and one of them is a ring. There's also a picture here in the book about a ring. And his son, Peter, right now, that at that time was six years old, it says here his son is still wearing that ring as of today. So one of the regiments that participate in the Korean War is the von Hoots. And um, they are the ones who preserve the legacy and the tradition of um, the participation in the Korean War. Um, they have uh, a location where they still uh, host the veterans. They come together there and there's a collection of all the um, uniforms, the, um, things that remember of, of that uh, period in time. And they were very uh, close comrades. Um, the battalion there, they, they were friends for life, the ones who survived it. And um, that's very uh, touching to see that still, I mean, when I met them. The right now they're late 80s, still uh, early 90s. They still come here and for these veteran uh, events. If they're still able to, to travel, they want to come here. So because they... They, um, they want to see themselves also, uh, to see how good the country is doing right now. So it was not in vain what they were fighting for. President Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, when peace has been broken anywhere, the peace of all countries everywhere is in danger. The current COVID-19 crisis shows once more how interconnected the world has become, how we all depend on each other for our well-being. So we should never stop fighting for a better world, for peace, together. This painting is uh, a rendition of the Battle of Goangsan, Hill 355, in which Canadian military participated. This is one of the, uh, the major engagements uh, in which Canadian troops were involved, at Goangsan, Hill 355. Um, these were all perimeter battles, primarily against the Chinese army and uh, the circumstances of the painting show a large visual vista of the, the battlefield and of the, some of the uh, maneuvers that the Canadian troops would have uh, made. It's interesting because there are many renditions of the Korean War in popular media and culture. This is one of the few uh, that was rendered in paint. The painter of this uh, was uh, Canadian uh, artist, uh, Ted Zuber. Ted Zuber was a young Canadian who participated in the Korean War, and what distinguishes 
him is while he was also here as a sniper, uh, at the same time he carried around his uh, sketchbook. And based on those sketches, uh, after the war he was able to do many different paintings of the Canadian experience primarily in the Korean War, but uh, uh, the Korean War as a subject in general as well. I think uh, art is a bit of a therapy for people in difficult times and uh, there's no shortage of great art uh, that has been produced as a result of uh, very violent events that surround the artist. Well, this uh, Hall of the, uh, the War Museum is dedicated to the participation of the UN command countries, including Canada. There's uh, some materials associated with the Canadian military involvement in Korean War. So different items such as clothing that was worn, the insignia of some of the Canadian regiments and units that were participating. And it's uh, sobering to realize that many of the items were worn not only by those who returned to Canada, but many that fell here in Korea. Well, the Hersey brothers is a very poignant case, and I remember I was uh, assigned to Korea. This was a bit, would have been about 10 years ago, and the story was that Archie had enlisted in the Canadian military, was already serving in Korea, and uh, his older brother Joseph, as older brothers tend to be, very protective, he also enlisted in order to, uh, to join his brother. I guess the thought would be somehow he would uh, protect him. And as fate would have it, uh, it was um, Joseph who paid the ultimate price. And he was killed in action and interred at the UN Military Cemetery in Busan. Over a half century later, uh, when it was Archie's turn to depart this earth, he made this uh, pledge that he wished to be interred with his brother in uh, the UN Cemetery in uh, Busan. And I believe that was one of the first cases where subsequent burial and a, a burial of uh, the remains of uh, two fallen were in the same plot. There was a lot of attention in the Korean media at that time and I think uh, nobody suffered more in the Korean War than uh, the Korean people and they saw echo of their own experience and their own uh, pain in the experience of these two brothers but it just showed the love and uh, loyalty that each of them had but also against the background of their sacrifice for Korea. I think it was a, a very poignant story. I remember 10 years ago being here and, and, and feeling that emotion and, um, and feeling that was widely shared in Korea. I think uh, the Korean Peninsula situation is an enormously complicated one and uh, it probably defies easy solution as I think uh, the efforts of the last uh, uh, 70, 65 or 70 years have shown. We're still in a state of, uh, of armistice. Some of the efforts that have been undertaking uh, recently and particularly with respect to Denuclearization showed some promise, but clearly we need a lot of patience, we need a lot of commitment, we need a lot of um, openness to flexibility, openness to innovation and approach. And um, I am not here to try to predict the future, but my, my hope would be perhaps in my lifetime we would see a normalization of Korean Peninsula. The world will mark the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. It is an event that unites Canada and Korea in a history of courage and sacrifice. Young Canadians came to Korea and many paid the ultimate sacrifice in the pursuit against aggression. That we can reunite at this time in continuing friendship to celebrate the achievement of all brave young persons in this war is an honor for us who are living.
In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky, the lark still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders field. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. My name is Moses Choma, ambassador of Hungary to Korea. North Korea and Hungary established diplomatic ties in 1948, and the Hungarian newspapers reported about the breakout of the Korean War uh, right after, on the second day of the Korean War, in uh, 26 June 1950. The Hungarian uh, leadership received a lot of uh, shocking news about uh, the battlefields of Korea. Uh, that's why the Hungarian government decided to send a medical team uh, to North Korea. And um, yeah, that medical team arrived on July 29, 1950. From 2007, I served as a Korean studies professor at the University of Budapest. And in uh, my capacity, I wrote uh, several books about the Korean history and uh, the relation between Hungary and the Korean Peninsula. This book, Memorandum of the Hungarians who visited the Korean Peninsula, has a special dedicated chapter to the Korean War. And uh, there are archive reports uh, from the Hungarian envoy Sándor Simic, who served in North Korea from April 1950. And uh, this report was written in December 1950 uh, about the hard circumstances uh, of uh, the population in North Korea. They were living in such poor surroundings that North Korean soldiers could not enlist them for the war. Not only civilians, but soldiers were suffering from frostbite. Many were sick from the harsh cold, and the typhus epidemic causing skin rashes began. After that kind of reports, the Hungarian government decided to send more and more medical teams to North Korea. From the summer of 1950, until 1957, around 300 Hungarian uh, medicians, physicians, and nurses worked in North Korea. Basically, the patients uh, were not just soldiers, but um, ordinary local citizens. And uh, there are some information that uh, not only North Korean soldiers were treated but also South Korean soldiers. South Korean soldiers who were wounded and uh, crossed uh, the front line uh, and reached the Hungarian Field Hospital to receive treatment there. There were many civilian casualties in the Korean War. And the Hungarian government, hearing that news, decided to accept 
North Korean orphans and students. And the first group of North Korean orphans arrived to Budapest uh, in late 1951. The Hungarian government established them a separate school, which was called Kim Il Song Elementary School and located in the most picturesque part of uh, the capital Budapest. One uh, very interesting part of this story that uh, after the Korean War in 1956, anti-communist and anti-Soviet revolution started in Hungary. And at that time, around 1,000 North Korean students were studying in Hungary, and especially the North Korean university students had war experience from the battlefield of the Korean War. And when the fights started in the streets of Budapest, the Hungarian university students fought with the uh, Soviet tanks in Budapest, the North Korean students helped a lot uh, for the Hungarian freedom fighters. They uh, showed them how to use the weapons properly because the North Korean students had war experiences from the battlefield of the Korean War. After the fall of the Hungarian Revolution uh, in November 1956, the North Korean leadership decided to call back all of the university students and high school students and elementary school students from Hungary. The Korean War was a war within one nation, started as a civil war. That's why it was particularly a huge tragedy. The 70 years anniversary of the Korean War should create a peaceful situation on the Korean Peninsula. In my capacity, not as ambassador, but as a Korean studies scholar, uh, I think one of the most important tasks to establish a common Korean national identity. And for uh, the creation of that uh, common identity is very important to unify the Korean history. The humankind should learn from the tragic experiences of the Korean War and the national separations. My name is Philip Turner. I'm New Zealand ambassador to South Korea and to North Korea. So on the 3rd of July 1950, two New Zealand Navy frigates left the Devonport Naval Base in Auckland, New Zealand and sailed to Korea. They arrived on July 30, 1950 to join in the effort uh, to support Korea in the Korean War. So the two frigates arrived in Korea towards the end of July. And then, as you know, in September, there was the uh, very important uh, Incheon landing operation by the United Nations uh, Command. Uh, the New Zealand frigates were able to join in that operation, uh, playing a supporting role to the, the troops who were landed at Incheon. And as you know, that was a major turning point uh, in the war uh, against North Korea. So at that stage, there were two New Zealand frigates involved. 
Uh, subsequently, um, another six New Zealand naval ships also came to Korea to join in the, the combat. My dear mother and dad, I was so glad to hear the party went off well. I only wished I had been there myself. The weather here certainly goes to the extremes. The average temperature is over 100 degrees during the day, and the night times in the winter, we absolutely freeze. Thinking of you always, fondest love to all, Bob. This is a letter written by a young New Zealand seaman named uh, Robert Marcioni. He was known as Bob. Uh, this is to his parents back in New Zealand. Uh, only 15 days after he wrote this letter, uh, he was unfortunately shot and killed uh, by North Koreans in a, a fighting reconnaissance mission just on the North Korean side of the current border. Unfortunately, uh, it was dark, uh, they were at a battle. His comrades were unable to retrieve his body, so it remains undiscovered in North Korea to this day. Now at Busan, at the United Nations Cemetery there, there is a headstone for him as part of the uh, gravesite for all of the New Zealanders who died during the Korean War. This letter uh, was written by one of the New Zealand veterans in January 1951, he was in Incheon, and he came across uh, a young boy uh, who had been captured by a, a North Korean soldier. So the New Zealand veteran, his name was Corporal Merv Reed, confronted the North Korean soldier and saved the boy from, from the North Korean. He didn't speak any Korean, the boy didn't speak English, but the boy gave him a badge from his school, Incheon Middle School. Corporal Reed, the veteran, took that back to New Zealand with him, but subsequently, unfortunately, lost the badge. He wrote to Incheon Middle School uh, to see if he could get another badge because it was full of precious memories for him. Uh, and he's also interested in finding that boy again. He would love to meet him. I never knew the boy's name. As he left, he called some words like, come up some and bowed respectfully, and then gave me his Incheon Middle School badge. I guess that, apart from the clothes he wore, that badge was the only thing he owned. As you will understand, that badge was a very dear part of my memories. Sadly, I recently lost it. So many times over the years I have remembered that boy and hope he's had a good life. Receiving the, the, the badge from the, the kid as a, as a memory of that moment was clearly very important to him. Uh, Corporal Reed then came back to Korea as a veteran several times, and each time he's come, he's, he's been amazed at the, the gratitude and the warmth of the, the welcome he has received in Korea uh, and the memories uh, that people preserve to this day. So for him, the whole uh, memory of the, the Korean War has been a very powerful part of, part of his life. Yeah, they, um, they never stopped saying thank you uh, for helping in 1950 when North Korea invaded. Mm. So uh, it's good that we have that strong relationship, yes. you know, and, um, and, and, and we value that too because uh, the, the South Korean people are so good to us, I just can't believe it. Because you are so good to us. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard for me to imagine, because I've not served in war, but especially for, for young men, and most of them were young men, some of them barely 20, to go to the other side of the world, to serve for your country, to fight for freedom, and to risk your life, um, is a a very powerful experience. I think it must really affect your whole life and the way you look at the world thereafter. Seventy years ago this year, thousands of young New Zealanders travelled halfway around the world, far from their native land, to a country they knew nothing of 
to fight and in many cases to die. They fought for peace and for freedom. Today, their descendants still serve on the Korean Peninsula with the United Nations Command, continuing that long-forged commitment to defending the people, the prosperity, and the freedom of the Republic of Korea. They serve today in the hope that war will never again occur on the Korean Peninsula. Hello, my name is Julian Clare and I'm the ambassador of Ireland to Korea. Ireland, um, at the time of the outbreak of the Korean War, was not yet a member of the United Nations. In fact, we were able to join the United Nations only in 1955. So we were not formally a part of UN command. However, a significant number of Irish people fought in the armies of the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Not just Irish-born citizens, but also people of Irish background. Madam, I am directed to refer to your letter dated the 15th of May, 1951. Regarding your brother, 69800027, Rifleman McSherry M, Royal Star Rifles, reported missing in action in Korea on the 3rd to the 4th of January, 1951. The letter I've just read um, refers to the action in the Battle of Happy Valley at the very end of 1950, in the beginning of 1951. Uh, in which the Royal Ulster Rifles served, served so, so courageously, and sadly the battle in which rifleman Michael McSherry lost his life. On the 31st of December 1950, the Chinese forces, in very considerable numbers, crossed the Imjin River, and the task, um, the exceptionally difficult task facing the Royal Ulster Rifles, was to essentially hold their ground and allow time for the evacuation of civilians from Seoul and the, also the evacuation of the UN forces to south of the Han River. In ferocious fighting and in terrible conditions, the Royal Ulster Rifles um, succeeded in holding their ground. However, in that fighting, um, they lost uh, the lives of 102 men and indeed others who were um, captured or wounded. A number of those who lost their lives to compound the tragedy, um, it was impossible at the time to recover their bodies, in which case they were, of course, declared missing. Yes, his wife um, devoted, as I understand, you know, tremendous energy in seeking to discover what had happened and to recover his remains. It's one of the most tragic aspects of a deeply tragic war, the, um, the circumstances of those who are missing in action. Thankfully, to the extent that thanks can be given in such tragic circumstances, um, his body and that of a number of his comrades in arms was indeed recovered for um, subsequent interment. Michael McSherry's daughter, uh, Elizabeth, has uh, written um, very poignantly about the experience of the, the loss of war for a family. What she said was, after I saw his grave, with his name engraved in gold letters. I finally came to terms with his death. When I was young, when I heard a knock at the door, it felt as if he would be standing at the door. The Society of St. Columban, 
the Columban Order, an Irish missionary order, had been established in Korea since 1933. And sadly, in the course of the war, eight Columban priests were to lose their lives, and indeed also um, uh, an Anglican nun, Sister Mary Clare. The seven priests who died uh, were Monsignor Patrick Bennon, who originally came from Chicago, but the others were all Irish-born, Father Thomas Cusack, Father Jack O'Brien, Father James McGinn, Father Anthony Collier, Father Patrick O'Reilly. And what was particularly poignant about um, their deaths was that um, they had the opportunity to, to leave Korea. This is a picture of Father Francis Canavan, um, who, like his colleagues in the Columban Order, had been advised by the US Army to, to leave Korea, but chose to stay instead with his community, come what may. Um, tragically, he was forced to take part in the infamous death march to North Korea, and indeed lost his life in Pongjanri in, in North Korea. I was very struck when I arrived here in August 2017 at the efforts that President Moon and his administration were making to reach out to North Korea in the face at the time of, of nuclear test and intercontinental ballistic missile provocations. And I think it is important to, um, to keep that opportunity for, for dialogue open, to try to draw in, to the extent that it is possible, North Korea into dialogue. And I think the response that Korea has shown, which is to keep trying and keep trying and to keep on, as I say, keeping on, uh, in spite of the disappointments uh, and setbacks, uh, is, the, is the right and only thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do, but I think it is the right thing to do. There's blood on the hills in Korea. It's the blood of the freedom we love. May our names live in glory forever and our souls rest in heaven above. And boys, when you go back to Dublin and Belfast, when this war is over and done, and forward they went into battle with faces unsmiling and stern, and some as they plodded and stumbled were softly saying this prayer. Just think of the ones left behind you out in the Korean sun.